Welcome, everyone, to the latest edition of State Scoops and Ed Scoops uh, Technology Webinar Series, brought to you today by the Hewlett Packard Enterprise Group and Intel. Uh, I'm your host, Wyatt Cash, Vice President for Content Strategy at State Scoop and Ed Scoop. And today we take a look at getting the infrastructure right for surveillance systems. Um, joining us today are um, actually we have three or four veteran public sector IT leaders who've tackled some of these issues firsthand and have kindly agreed to share some of the key lessons they've learned. Uh, first, I'm pleased to welcome to the program uh, Lieutenant Greg Minter, who uh, works for the Mansfield Police Department. Greg, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. Uh, also joining us today uh, is Jeff Burgess. Jeff is president for BCD Video. Uh, um, Jeff, welcome to the program. Thank you, Wyatt. Glad to be here. And also joining us, we're pleased to welcome Lisa Ho, the campus privacy officer at the University of California at Berkeley. Thanks so much, Wyatt. And uh, also joining us a little later will be uh, Greg Herbold, Director of U.S. Programs for State and Local Government and Education at Hewlett Packard Enterprises, and he'll be joining us momentarily. Um, I, also I have actually joined Wyatt. Nice to be here. Oh, terrific. Greg, glad uh, you could make it there. Um, I also want to welcome our audience, including those joining us live today, as well as those tuning into the archived on-demand edition of this program. Uh, before we begin, um, I'd like to just uh, help our audience get familiar with our console and how they can participate. Um, on your viewing console, there are multiple application widgets that you can open and adjust in size, uh, including a Q&A window. Uh, and we invite all of our listeners to submit your questions to our presenters during the webcast, and we'll try to answer as many of those during the live webcast as we can, uh, either after each presentation or at the end of the program. Uh, also want to remind our viewers, you can download a copy of today's slide deck uh, simply by clicking the file in the resource list widget. Um, and if you don't see it on your screen, it's, there's a folder icon at the bottom that should give you access to that. And um, you can also expand the size of your slide presentation window either by clicking the max, maximize button on the top of the screen or just uh, dragging and clicking. Um, and finally, um, the on-demand version, as I mentioned, of this webcast will also be available. We'll post it starting um, February uh, 18th, and it will be available for 90 days. So if you have colleagues that uh, uh, weren't able to make it today whom you'd like to share this with, uh, you just need to send them the link that you received in your email. So with that, um, let's get started. Um, uh, Lieutenant Minter, uh, again, welcome to the program. You've been working on ways to improve how uh, the Mansfield Police Department um, actually deals with uh, this rising um, challenge of uh, cataloging surveillance uh, video, uh, how to think about storing and managing it. And uh, tell us a little bit of some of the things that you're learning and uh, maybe some of the biggest takeaways. Well, uh, thanks for having me, first of all, uh, and uh, good afternoon or morning to uh, everybody, wherever you're listening from. Mansfield ISD, uh, prior to 2011, had a system in place for video cameras or surveillance cameras. It was a very small system. Of course, school districts grow, and you add more facilities over the years. But we were using IP-based cameras and standalone servers at each location. The district itself had a total of around 55, 60 cameras at that time. In 2011, the school district passed a bond, and which included around $12 million for safety and security. Part of that was around $8 million for controlled access and security cameras to be placed at every facility within the school district. Through that process and uh, the last four years, we have learned a, a, a great deal as far as uh, what our infrastructure can handle and what it can't. And uh, that's kind of what I'm here today to talk about is the lessons learned from uh, Mansfield ISD's uh, project for safety and security through our bond election. To tell you a little bit about the school district and some facts, just to give you an idea, Mansfield ISD is located just south of Arlington, Texas. And anybody out there listening, Arlington, Texas is the home of the uh, Dallas Cowboys and Texas Rangers baseball team. Uh, we're 95 square miles approximately. We have 
over 33,000 students, uh, over 4,000 staff members. Uh, as you can tell by the slide that I'm showing now, uh, 23 elementaries, six intermediates, six middle schools, five high schools. We have one 11th, 12th grade center that's located within our Career and Technology Academy. Uh, we have an alternate education campus and two athletic stadiums where they play more than just football, there's soccer and other things. Two performing arts facilities. One of the performing arts facilities is, is relatively new and state of the art. It's, it's used by uh, uh, Dallas Symphony. Uh, many outside uh, agencies come in to use our performing arts center. Uh, we have two, transport, two transportation facilities, six administration buildings, one education complex, uh, and maintenance facility agricultural science complex, and that complex uh, is where our ag kids, agricultural students, actually house their animals. It's very large uh, on, a, on a lot of acreage. So from what I've shown you here, you can tell that, that we have a fairly large district that's spread out over 95 square miles, which during our planning phase, we had to determine what kind of system did we want. Were we going to be able to uh, uh, put a system in that could we could manage with a $311 million operating budget for the school district? In any system you put in, there's going to be different upkeep and, and, and replacements that you're going to have to do over the years. So that was one of the determining factors. During our planning process, uh, you know, you, we have to ask the right questions. And early on, we met with uh, uh, consultants and individuals uh, to, to try to get an idea of exactly what we needed. We, we looked at different camera management systems that were out there. We brought in different camera manufacturers and took a look at their cameras. Uh, we talked to our IT department uh, to decide exactly what it is that, that they would want us to do. And when planning this, you have to decide, do you want a DVR system, uh, which is a basic system. You can buy those at, at Sam's, Walmart, that kind of thing, or a site-based server or virtual servers. Uh, how much storage are you going to need for the amount of cameras that you have? Right now, Mansfield ISD has over 1,700 cameras. So we went from having around 55, 60 cameras to having over 1,700 cameras. And there's a new law in effect in the state of Texas that special education classrooms where a special education student could spend more than 50% of their time during a school day, those classrooms beginning September 1st of 2016 will have to have cameras and audio in those classrooms. And they'll have to record pretty much nonstop throughout the school day. We have to save at least six months of recorded video, 180 days. That's a large server whenever you're talking about uh, cameras. And, you know, what, what kind of format do you want to save that in? JPEG, MPEG, H.264? These are all questions that uh, we have to ask ourselves. How many frames per second do you want to save? Uh, four frames, 25 frames? How much compression do you want? Uh, and, and the goal is to... Uh, have the least amount of lossless compression whenever you're saving video. What, what kind of resolution are you looking for? Are, are you looking at the HD quality? Or are you looking at the, some older type quality? Are you wanting to record on motion? Or do you want the, the cameras to record nonstop? Uh, are you going to be using analytics? Uh, do you want a camera that will track movement? If you do, then that camera is going to be recording more because it's going to see movement a lot. Uh, than a, a camera that's just stationary and told to record on nothing but motion. Are my expectations too high for my current network infrastructure? These are questions you have to ask yourself, and, and you have to be honest uh, when doing this. And I, I'm, I'm talking about this because we lived it, we went through it. Is the server capable of archiving and running the video management software at the same time? We, we actually went out and, and the determination was made that we were going to go virtual. We were going to use virtual servers. We were going to pipe everything back to a centralized location throughout our many buildings and campuses in this 95 square miles. 
in the beginning, it worked until we got up to about 300 cameras installed. And remember, we have over 1,700 right now. Once we got up to 300 cameras, the system uh, really started shutting down. The, the servers that we uh, had on hand, virtual servers, were not able to do live video and archive at the same time. Uh, how many cameras can the server facilitate? You need to be well informed. Find someone who, who's going to operate the same system that you're looking at and that you want to use and see if it works. If you can't find anybody that's doing that, using that system, it's a pretty good indicator that it's not going to work. And, and honestly, our, uh, our individuals that, uh, that were doing our install gave us a heads up and told us what you're wanting to do uh, is really not going to work based on what you've told us and, and what you want out of this video system. Uh, we didn't want any lag. We wanted to be able to watch live and see live. Uh, and they gave us a heads up and said, we would recommend you not do virtual servers. We went ahead and, and, and went forward with that. And I'll, I'll give some lessons learned on that here in a minute. If you throw enough money at anything, it will eventually work. Well, that's not always true. I put that quote in there because that is what an individual told us when we asked them about halfway through this process of virtual servers, is this going to work? Well, if you throw enough money at it, anything will work. Well, in, in the public school sector, you can't really afford to throw, keep throwing money at something when it doesn't work. Keep planning. That is the key to this. Pick the right vendor. Uh, low bid is not always what's best. And I put this in here to, to kind of get your attention. Do you choose a babysitter based on cost alone, or do you consider experience and work history as well? Uh, I personally uh, would choose somebody who knows what they're doing and, and uh, has a background in this. Uh, certified does not always mean capable. Just because an individual is certified in a certain thing doesn't mean that they're actually capable of doing it. Check to make sure certificates used for the bidding process uh, belong to current employees and not past employees. We tend to run across that uh, when individuals bid on projects. Uh, they're, they're using certifications from past employees. Uh, work together. If your IT department thinks they are the smartest people in the room, you're in trouble. I'm here to tell you. Lessons learned. If you have not done this before, then everyone should have an open mind and be willing to learn. Everybody. Consultants. Sometimes you need consultants. Consultants, uh, but again, if they think that they're smarter than everybody else in the room, you're going to be in trouble. Everybody needs to listen and learn from one another and, and go out and seek advice from other individuals. Uh, if individuals, especially your consultants, tell you that it can be done, make them prove it. If they can't prove it, it probably can't be done. You need to test your product. Find a manufacturer that will give you their product and demo that product on your terms. About a year and a half into our project, we determined it wasn't going to work. Virtual was not going to work for us by trying to pipe all this back to one centralized location. So I went through our integrator, uh, Electrolink, and asked them to set me up with somebody who could uh, provide us with a server to test. They set me up with, or, or us up with uh, BCD video. We brought them in, uh, told them this is what we want, and I asked them for a server that I could put 80 cameras on and save for 30 days. And I gave them my frame rates, how often I was going to be recording it. And I think there's a question about that in, in one of the questions. And what I would say is go to your video management software company's website, and the good ones will have the uh, a page for you to put in all that information on, on what, what settings you want your cameras to, to have and how much recording you want them to keep, and it will tell you exactly how much storage you need. Uh, BCD Video gave us a server. I took it out to our high school campus. Instead of putting 80 cameras on it, I put 120 cameras on it. And I kept that server for over 30 days to make sure that it would actually keep for 30 days. They built the server for 80 cameras, but it kept 120 cameras of storage at my settings for 30 days. So they proved it could work, and I was sold at that point.
if uh, if they're not willing to do that for you, then move on and, and find somebody that will. Make them prove that their product will work. And when I say test it like you own it, keep it. If you if you want 60 days of storage, make them let you have that for 60 days. Uh, if you have 120 cameras, then put 120 cameras on it. Uh, don't wait until it's too late. If you if you continue and you're told that a product works and it doesn't, you have two options. Keep playing with it, and over time you're going to end up owning it. Or return it and find one that will work. And once again, I, I'm, I'm giving lessons learned based on what we went through and what we dealt with. And I would say relationship with your integrator, your installers, is very important. Uh, we have not walked away from that relationship uh, from day one. They've been great for us. Even though we tried to do something they recommend we not do. Uh, we had to learn our own lessons. BCDV, uh, they've, we've had one power failure uh, since they've been with us, and that was replaced the next day. Uh, do your homework. That's all I ask. And with that, uh, I'll end my presentation. Great. Uh, thank you, Lieutenant Minter. really appreciate that. Um, before we turn it over to Jeff, uh, a quick question for you. When you hit that uh, 300 camera limit uh, and suddenly the system was not able to keep up, what did you uh, understand to be the problem? Was it um, uh, the software capabilities? Was it uh, the virtual capacity on the server itself? What, what at the end of the day, was the ceiling that you ran into? Well, there, there were two things that we were dealing with. One was our bandwidth, of course. Mansfield ISD gives out iPads to every high school student and every middle school student. And then we have uh, a program that's called Bring Your Own for all of our other cam campuses, intermediates and elementaries. So there are a lot of devices in our district at any one time that's using our, our, uh, our bandwidth and uh, our Wi-Fi. Uh, the other problem that we dealt with on the virtual server was the more cameras we put on there, the longer it took for those cameras to archive the, the previous day's video. And what we found was it was running over into the next day while we're trying to watch the cameras live. And, and the system that we chose, every administrator in our district, from high school campuses to elementaries, uh, are able to log into the cameras and watch their campus's cameras. And when you have that many people doing that, plus the system archiving at the same time, uh, we ran into a lot of issues. Uh, and it just it, it did not work for us. Well, I appreciate that. Well, and I really appreciate the very specific questions you were asking and um, just some of the lessons that you learned. And uh, uh, so I'd like now to move to uh, Jeff Burgess. Jeff uh, is president, again, of uh, BCD Video and uh, someone that's very familiar with this space. Uh, Jeff, tell us a little bit more of what you kind of see from your perspective. Well, uh, Thank you, White, and again, I, I'm happy to be part of this uh, event, even though Lieutenant Minter is always a tough act I have to try and follow, but I'm going to do my best. So if, I'll give you a quick overview about uh, BCD Video. Uh, as Hewlett Packard Enterprises um, Global OEM for Video Storage, um, we, work with, uh, we work with security integrators all over the world. Uh, they've installed over 20,000 of our recording systems in six continents and 40 um, countries. Uh, so we've got a very good history of life success um, with our solution. The, um, you know, one of the things is, you know, what should you be looking for in your video surveillance infrastructure? And um, first and foremost is going to be the bandwidth. Um, you know, some of the stuff I probably say is not going to be repetitious to what Lieutenant Minter said. But bandwidth is key, especially on the network. You have to ask yourself the question, is my existing network designed for, um, designed for IP video cameras? And if not, you're probably going to need a parallel network, which more often than not you do, because you really don't want to run your video cameras on the same network, your same pipe, if you will, as your IT data. Bear in mind that one 1080p camera takes about two to three megabit of network stream. A five megapixel camera takes about four to five megabit of network stream. 
and a 20 megapixel camera, which are getting more and more used because the camera prices keep coming down and people want higher and higher resolution, them alone take 20 to 30 megabit per camera on, you know, on your network stream. So you really want to make sure you've got your network set up or that's really the bloodline of your system. Then you have to look at what's going on in your genre and your vertical regarding like re, uh, retention regulations. The Coast Guard has regulations on all commercial vessels in the U.S. that have to have six months of light recording. Um, the payment card industry, Visa, MasterCard, Discover, they have to have on-premises retention for, for a, a period of three months. Lieutenant already mentioned the, uh, the um, special education classes in the Texas schools. Correctional like facilities are now three years of uh, of storage archival just for possible civil rights violations. Uh, here's a one: well, Illinois marijuana fields and the farms uh, had a 30-day uh, re, uh, 30-day retention overnight that was turned into 90 days uh, with no forewarning, and they had 30 days to like comply or else pay possible fines and penalties. Even McDonald's, your local light McDonald's, uh, per legal, it's a 60-day per store of light retention just for the possible loss prevention of somebody claiming that they slipped on the floor. So these are the kind of things that you have to really put into your play before you even start looking at what am I going to do for a video light recorder. And the most important thing in a video recorder today is not the storage. It is the bandwidth. Anybody can build a 100 terabyte server today. You can buy the chassis with all the drive bays and start putting in drive bays. Can you build a recorder in such a way that it can ingest all the necessary video bandwidth coming in from those cameras? That's what makes the, makes the system work. So you want to really look at the bandwidth capabilities more than anything. Then obviously the storage capabilities and these days again, you, you know, in, in our case we can do 200 terabytes of, of usable storage in a 2U rack space. So internal storage certainly works, but you've got to have the bandwidth capabilities. And in our case that one can do up to 1300 megabits per second, so it's not a problem. And, and, and then you want to make that, is it durable? You know, is it up and running every day? First and foremost, does it have a warranty? Does it have a real warranty? You know, bumper to bumper, everything inside that system is covered under on-site warranty. So having a warranty is great. However, if you if you know the tech's first name after a month of having the system, you've got real problems because your server's down too much. And when the server's down, nothing is recording. And if an incident happens, that's where your potential liability could be. And lastly, you want to look at scalability. You want to make sure you're not getting a unit that's already maxed out. So ask the simple question when you when you do look for a unit, can I add any more of the same cameras with the same type of um, like criteria? And if the answer is no, you have to realize you're buying a maxed out system. If the answer is you can add 3, 7, 12, some magic number, that's a great start. Then ask the follow-up question of are there any open drive base? And if yes, how many more cameras can I can I add per of the same hard drive? And the answer should be 20 to 30. So now you know if you happen to, to bust through your walls and, and, and want to build out, you can add 20 to 40 more cameras other than the camera cost for the mere price of adding a hard drive for about $800 as opposed to spending $5,000 for a brand new system. Um, and you also want to make sure that 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 the that the server has been tested and certified on the video software that you're looking to use. I can't emphasize this en enough. There's a difference um, in the market of having a system running, let's say, Genentech software, than a system that's built for Genentech software. You want to make sure it's the latter. Is the system built for that software? I mean, here's six major software companies. We can build a 24 terabyte server for any of these six, and I promise you, not one is built the same way because of the idiosyncrasies within that software. So you want to also ask those questions. Um, and then if you look at the result of having an optimized video server, you know, Genentech and Milestone are the two biggest software companies in the world. And, you know, the, the, I guess the, the slide speaks for itself of what our servers can do. Um, 
then you want to look at what you're buying in a server. And this is where the video s uh, server market is very atypical from the IT market. And I'm an XT guy for 25 years. Okay, first of all, chassis. This is not a blade market. There's no play in this market for blades. Blades do serve a purpose in IP. I know you can put 16 blades in a 10U disk, uh, disk enclosure. All the power savings. The problem with blades in this market, they don't have the bandwidth capabilities what a true rack server can have, and they certainly don't have the storage capabilities. So you're going to have to go to some type of external networked rack solution. Uh, after that is the processor. You certainly want to use newest generation in, uh, Intel processors. There's no play here for AMD. And, but it's definitely in, in Intel market force. But you don't need the 2690 level processors or two processors. I mean, most of our servers are built on, on 2620 and 2630 uh, V3 newest generation. So adding more processors doesn't necessarily make the system run any faster. Same thing goes true with memory. You don't need 512 gigabyte of memory. This is a 16 gig memory market. So if, if if someone's trying to sell you all this extra RAM to make the thing go faster, is there is not adding one iota to their like performance and taken out of your ROI. Hard drives are very important in this market. I'm going to get to that in the next slide, and and, and also like I said, we the video management software. It's, each one writes differently. There's different ways that they that they do disc disc fragmentation, um, and it's, this is where the rubber meets the moat in video is how the hard drives are set up, how the storage, how the RAID is set up, and how the video management. That's where that's replaced processor speeds and RAM for our market. Um, so if you look at at, at using SAS hard drives, you know, SAS technology, there's basically ba they're like bidirectional hard drives with twice the bandwidth over SATA. SATA is the old historical data. Uh, it used to be called cheap and deep because, you know, you, it was just big storage. Uh, SA uh, the SAS drives have much better mean time before failure rates. And because of using SAS technology, you get higher performance. You don't get these I.O. bottlenecks. And an I.O. bottleneck in our market is kind of like DirecTV during a snowstorm. And you get your pixelated screens and your frozen screens on your video viewers. Um, you don't get those in SAS technology. You also get to run more cameras per server and higher resolutions um, of cameras being used. And again, real quick on, on SAS and SATA, it's dual port versus single port. I mean, so I can read, I can ingest the camera data simultaneously while I'm writing to the video screens. Very fluid flow of data. SATA is single port. I'm doing either or on one or the other, and that's where you have your, your, uh, your congestion. Uh, just a, a few more slides. I mean, here's two different basic layouts. Here's a centralized thing. This is where everything is writing to, in this case, we're using uh, the uh, three power storage. It's a SAN. You'll hear the word SAN here. You know, there's iSCSI, the terminology. It's basically off the network, and everything is writing it, it, to the SAN. There, it's getting local recording and writing to, the, to, to this yellow box in the right over the network. So it's very heavy on the network load. Uh, what we do more of in this market is a distributed architecture. These are also known as edge servers, and this is what, uh, what Lieutenant, Mansfield, uh, Lieutenant Minter has at Mansfield. Um, is these are edge recorders that literally um, are writing at each location that he mapped out. Everyone has their own server in the uh, in the site. They only bring data over the network. On a, on a per incident basis when you want to view. So it's much less havoc on that network. Um, in closing, you know, we have a great relationship with the Elo Packard Enterprise. Um, they've done case studies on us. Um, you know, 47 of the top 50 integrators in the world are standardized on our servers. Uh, and it's because we build on an, we build on a baseline of an HP Enterprise server and when you're building on the world's greatest IT server, you know, you got to have a pretty good video server. And um, with that, um, thank you for your time and, uh, and hearing you know, me out. Uh, Jeff, thank you very much. And um, 
Uh, I want to um, hear from Lisa in just a minute, but a couple of questions from our audience that I think would be timely to ask. Uh, one is from Benjamin, uh, and it's a basic question of, uh, is there a preference for wired versus wireless cameras? What are the pros and cons, given what you had to say about bandwidth? Um, you know, actually, uh, I'm just, I, I, I don't really have the, the right answer. If he wants to reach out to me directly, I can find the right person. We don't sell cameras. We don't sell software. We just work with all the camera companies, you know, to make the service that work for them. But I don't, uh, you know, I don't want to guess at that one at all. But if, if a, he, that, if Benjamin, if you want to send me, if you want to send me some information, I can definitely have somebody uh, get you that answer. Uh, maybe, uh, Lieutenant Minter, I'll double back with you just briefly. Uh, is that a question that your school district explored? We did at, at different locations. We have locations throughout our district that uh, our bandwidth is not that great. Uh, and what we had to do was set up kind of a, a dish system to send uh, that information from those cameras to a different location, maybe across the parking lot. Uh, and, and those cameras don't really run very optimally because of that. Uh, we do have locations that uh, on top of our performing arts center where we may want to put a wireless camera. Well, there are a lot of things that can go wrong with wireless cameras, uh, interference, uh, those kind of things. Plus, most cameras today require PoE, power over Ethernet, or uh, power by hard wire. Uh, and most of our cameras are hardwired or powered over Ethernet. So uh, we elected not to go with wireless. Just too many things that we researched that could go wrong. That makes sense. And uh, maybe one more question, uh, Jeff. I think this is one that does fall in your domain. Uh, uh, Benjamin, so. again, in our audience, asks um, the pros and cons of using uh, SAN for storage uh, versus a direct attached storage approach. Well, um, First of all, internal storage is always going to run the fastest, you know, and it's like distributed accordingly. And then direct attached storage um, is is runs almost as fast uh, as the um, as the storage inside the server because the uh, SAS connection is like an eight lane superhighway. Think of the autobahn for transporting data. So the only downside we see on the SAN is just how fast is your network? Because you can have fast drives in the SAN and you know great drives in the SAN, but you're still have you're still under the um, under the like constraints of that network. Uh, if you've got a 10 gig network, obviously it's gonna it's gonna great you know great. So you know we do a lot of SAN type iSCSI you know off the network and school districts where there might be certainly nothing like the campus that Lieutenant Minter uh, has in his, you know, domain. But, you know, where there's like five schools that are doing localized storage overnight, you know, I mean, during the day and then overnight they all upload that day's storage to, uh, to a SAN solution in the district administration office. Um, you know, we, we, I'd say 95% of our builds are, are all on internal uh, server, you know, rack servers without using SAN. It just seems the edge, the edge storage is just more in play for our market these days. At least That's for us, know. you know, for our goals. That's great. Well, we've been talking about the technical side, uh, but you know, I think uh, most school districts, uh, certainly the education and uh, state market in general, when we're looking at uh, surveillance uh, videos, um, the, the whole issue of privacy uh, is a key part of managing. Um, you know, all this data. And, and uh, I'm interested now to turn it over to Lisa, uh, again, Campus e Privacy Officer at the University of California. Uh, Lisa, uh, tell us some of the things that you're looking at and how it fits in the, in the sort of uh, landscape here. Thanks so much, Wyatt. My name is Lisa Ho, and I'm the Campus Privacy Officer at University of California, Berkeley. I'm very pleased to be part of this webinar to talk about privacy infrastructure in surveillance systems. And right off the bat, I want to acknowledge that privacy infrastructure and surveillance systems might sound like an oxymoron. At the University of California, we talk about two types of privacy. One of them, autonomy privacy, is an individual's ability to conduct activities without concern of or actual observation. So depending on how you define surveillance, autonomy privacy does sound a lot like an antonym for surveillance. However, at the University of California, we have a two-part definition for privacy, 
And in, in addition to autonomy privacy, which I just mentioned, there's also information privacy, which is the appropriate protection, use, and dissemination of information about individuals. And our privacy statement of values recognizes that these two types of privacies need to be balanced with each other and with our other values and priorities. So we need to keep our protection efforts in check with our autonomy values, and I'll talk quite a bit about balance today. And that's how we get to the concept of privacy infrastructure in our surveillance systems. And so while the previous presentations by Lieutenant Minter and Jeff focused on the technical infrastructure for video, my portion covers a general privacy infrastructure applicable in many contexts. So I'm going to cover a three-part privacy infrastructure, evaluate, balance, and design. Evaluate the privacy interests of the individuals subject to surveillance, and balance those privacy interests with the organization's multiple interests, values, and priorities. And then design appropriate privacy objectives into the structure of the surveillance system. So let's talk about evaluating privacy interests of the individuals who are subject to surveillance. How can we worry about privacy interests when we have a job to do, whether it's protecting or processing or educating or what have you? As a privacy officer, I'm here to plug the privacy interests of the individual. Individual privacy interests go back to the founding of the United States and beyond, but I'll save that discussion for another time because simply put, when we create problems for individuals, we create problems for organizations. I won't go into the legal considerations, which are certainly um, very important because they're so context specific and should be determined by your legal counsel. These are the considerations beyond the legal requirements or in addition to the legal requirements. I'm very fond of a framework for privacy risk management published in draft form last year by the National Institute for Standards and Technology. NIST is an agency of the U.S. Department of Congress. It has a catalog of problematic data actions and a catalog of resulting problems for individuals. Regarding the scoping around data, rather than try to draw a line between what's data and what isn't data, I believe the framework can be applied very broadly, and it's particularly useful when we start amassing data and analyzing and transforming and cross-referencing that data with other systems. In those scenarios, the privacy impact grows exponentially. So let's look at some of the problematic data actions and the problems they create for individuals. Appropriation is the use of personal information in ways that exceed an individual's expectation or authorization, in ways that an individual would object to or would have expected additional value for. In 2008, the UK license plate scanning technology, or license plate scanning technology was combined with vehicle registration data to flash customized motor, customized motor oil advertisements on giant billboards to motorists as they drove by. The public and the government agency as well were not happy with that appropriation of vehicle registration data. That's one example. Distortion is use or dissemination of inaccurate or misleadingly incomplete personal information. Distortion can present users in an inaccurate, unflattering, or disparaging manner. The error rate in technology, such as facial recognition software, could create this risk of distortion. Induced disclosure. This is pressure to divulge information. Induced disclosure can occur when users feel compelled to provide information disproportionate to the purpose or outcome of the transaction. This can include leveraging access to an essential or perceived essential service. I want to point out that all of these problematic data actions are not binary or absolute. What is proportionate in one context can be disproportionate in another. For example, in a slightly different realm, one university in Oklahoma requires students to wear Fitbits and upload that data to their student information system. That may work with their education system, but a mandatory requirement like this wouldn't fit our community norms at UC Berkeley. There's a lot of movement toward mining data and making maximum use of the data we have. But just because you can do something technically does not mean you should do it. Insecurity. This uh, protecting data from unauthorized access, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. And surveillance. I'll point out that in the NIST report, which is still in draft, so it may change, this def report defines surveillance as tracking or monitoring of personal information that is disproportionate to the purpose or outcome of the service. So in this framework, monitoring, which may be appropriate, becomes surveillance when it leads to harms such as power imbalance, loss of trust, or loss of autonomy. 
So for this webinar, we won't use that definition of surveillance, and we'll assume that surveillance can be appropriate and proportionate to the purpose. Unanticipated revelation. This is non-contextual use of data that reveals or exposes as individual or facets of an individual in unexpected ways. Unanticipated revelation can arise from aggregation and analysis of large and or diverse data sets. And here I'd like to mention that the distinction between personally identifiable information and non-personally identifiable information is blurry because researchers have proven that you can re-identify data that is seemingly anonymized when you pull together multiple data sets. And finally, unwarranted restriction. Unwarranted restriction to personal information includes not only blocking access to personal information, but also limiting awareness of the existence of the information within the system or the uses of that information. So secret monitoring would fall under unwarranted restriction. So all these problematic data actions can lead to problems for individuals, such as loss of determination. And here we're coming back to the autonomy privacy definition from earlier an individual's ability to conduct activities without concern of or actual observation. Loss of privacy can lead to discrimination. It can lead to loss of trust. This is key, a key privacy harm that stands out for any kind of organization or institution. We must uphold those social contracts that give our organizations legitimacy. And economic loss for the individuals. So this can, from economic loss for individuals may also lead to economic loss for the surveilling institutions. So NIST has given us a useful framework to use for evaluating the privacy impact on those individuals who will be subject to surveillance. As a privacy officer, these impacts to individuals are of immense concern to me, but I've sometimes called myself a, in a privacy fundamentalist, meaning I think of privacy as a fundamental or necessary starting place, but I'm also pragmatic in, my, in that fundamentalism because I understand that as institutions, we need to balance privacy with multiple priorities, obligations, and interests. We need to achieve our interest, we need to achieve our mission, our security, accountability, compliance, transparency, all the things, all those interests need to be balanced with privacy. And we bring all those interests into balance when we apply governance. Governance infrastructure brings a logical and repeatable structure to these balancing decisions. Technology is constantly changing. These aren't one-time decisions. Governance brings the organization's context, its mission, its mores, together with the specifics of any given scenario. Transparency. Governance done in secret lacks accountability. And together with transparency, privacy impacting decisions shouldn't be made by technology staff in a cold, dark server room in the data center. Sufficient stakeholder representation is another element of legitimacy. So how does a governance body balance privacy with other interests? By weighing multiple scenarios from multiple perspectives. What are the benefits, burdens, and impacts and risks to each party? What actions and alternatives are available to protect interests, and what are the costs of those options? Privacy interests can be quietly whittled away without notice when stacked against the tangible crisis of the day. So it's the job of the governance process to ensure that privacy interests remain visible and get appropriate weight in the process of balancing the institution's multiple obligations and values. From the governance process that determines appropriate balance of privacy risk, we need an infrastructure for building those privacy decisions into the design of the surveillance system. I come back to the NIST privacy risk management framework that gave us the problematic data actions and the problems for individuals that we reviewed earlier. The framework offers three privacy engineering objectives to enable system designers and engineers to build information systems to implement the privacy goals established by the privacy balancing process. Predictability is about enabling reliable assumptions about the processing of personal information. This goes a step beyond transparency. Providing a tri privacy notice that's not read or does not provide predictability, and big data and pri secondary data use both challenge the notion that we can provide appropriate notice and transparency in advance. So predictability is the idea that you can expect what's being done and it's contextually appropriate. 
Manageability is providing the capability for granular administration of personal information, including alteration, deletion, and selective disclosures. It may or may not be appropriate for individuals to be able to manage their own data, but appropriately privileged actors need to be able to maintain accuracy and fair treatment of individuals. This could apply to tagging a video, for example. And disassociability is the enabling of processing of personal information or events without the association to individuals or devices beyond the operational requirements of the system. I mentioned earlier that anonymization is a challenge with advancing technology. Full anonymization is awful, often at odds with usability, so setting the disassociability privacy objective is about selecting controls to appropriately manage the association of data with individuals. Should blurring technology, be it facial blurring, be applied? Should facial recognition be applied? These are pieces that need to be balanced with the other objectives and values of the organization. So these three privacy engineering objectives create a framework for designing privacy into the technical infrastructure of a surveillance system. So to review, the privacy infrastructure involves evaluating privacy interests of the individuals, balancing multiple obligations and values of the organization, and using governance to put those into place, and designing for appropriate privacy. So with that, I thank you all, and if any questions, I'm happy to take those. Well, thank you very much, Lisa. And <clears throat> clearly, um, you bring out a dimension that I think uh, is not as well thought through, and uh, certainly um, people from the technical side probably aren't necessarily as, quite as connected to the policy side, but the two need to come together. One question I have, um, and then I'd like to, uh, again, re invite our audience to submit uh, their additional questions using the chat function. But my question, um, uh, if you could just talk a little bit about the um, the adoption of facial recognition technologies and then the ability to analyze that. We, we are increasingly uh, subject to that in all kinds of places. Um, what are your thoughts on, on how to incorporate that into the framework you discussed? So I uh, bring that back to definitely in different contexts. It's a local and very context-specific um, question. On our Berkeley campus, we don't um, apply any enhancements like facial recognition to the video uh, surveillance or video security cameras that are used um, because they are, um, our system is specifically a recall system if an incident occurs that during a specific time in a specific place, then the police force will go and, and collect that data to, for review rather than trying to do um, an analysis of that data um, in advance or taking that data in. And so that is um, a very context-specific question because our campus is very um, concerned about privacy that in the um, the community that we have is not interested in that kind of in moving that direction. There are also cost concerns in, in moving that direction. Um, in another scenario, that may be very appropriate in in um, Super Bowl, you know, doing facial recognition for on the security cameras. That may be the appropriate thing to do in that kind of situation. It, again, it comes back to that governing decision. It shouldn't be made in the back room by technologists. It should be made in a, in a transparent way, balancing multiple values. I appreciate that. Um, Lieutenant Minter, I'd like to throw that question your way as well. How, how do you look at the uh, issue of facial recognition as you continue to um, uh, round out what your system is capable of doing and preserving? Well, we, we've looked at different cameras that are out there. Uh, we do have uh, one camera uh, in place that uh, we put in, a, in an area where we had a lot of copper thefts. And, uh, we didn't use facial recognition, but it, it had the ability to track movement and, and follow movement, movement, zoom in on it, that kind of thing. Being a school district, we, we kind of fall under uh, different rules than, say, the public sector. Uh, whether we use facial recognition or not, the video footage that we receive is really regulated by FERPA. And it's considered part of an individual's educational record unless it's used for uh, disciplinary action. So we really can't release that video except to a parent of a student who was disciplined and that video was used in the disciplinary process. So our rules, uh, once again, are a lot different. And being a police department, if it's evidentiary, 
We use that video as part of a uh, criminal case. Uh, we're not going to release it to the public during that process. Uh, so I can't answer that as far as the public sector, but as far as educational and police, we just we don't release it without a subpoena. Appreciate that. So um, before we get to the final list of questions, I want to bring uh, Greg Herbold in from uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Uh, Greg, you've been listening in. Any thoughts that you have on um, kind of the best practices? Yes, Wyatt, thank you very much. Um, you know, and first of all, uh, my name is Greg Herbold, as you mentioned, and I'm the director of U.S. public sector at Hewlett Packard Enterprise. And on behalf of Intel, uh, who's our co-sponsor, um, you know, I want to thank the speakers today for a great session. And I do just have a few closing comments. You know, getting the foundation right for video surveillance is critical. Um, the challenge of effective and efficient video capture and management today are only going to grow more complicated and taxing as expectations turn to analytics and integrated systems and new policy requirements and so on. And as we've heard from the speakers today, getting your video surveillance foundation right requires a few key things. Um, you know, as we heard from Lieutenant Minter, right, diligent in planning a solution, evaluating your technical technical options and your partners, all very important. As we heard from Jeff, right, expertise in tailoring those IT systems to work optimally for video is really critical. Planning for things like bandwidth and retention that are more important than you possibly know uh, or potentially know. Um, and then as we heard from Lisa, right, balancing the benefits of surveillance data, you know, with the need for governance and, and privacy engineering objectives and factoring all that into decisions such as what to record and where to store it. So in our SLED practice at Hewlett Packard Enterprise, we know that government and education customers are facing a host of new demands and challenges, right? Legislation is creating unfunded mandates. Uh, Lieutenant Minter, Minter mentioned one in Texas. Retention requirements are getting longer. Transparency requirements are creating the need for more resources to actually watch all of the video and redact and compile and post and integrate the videos. And the demands of, of you know things like this and the analytics are, are stringent and, and growing daily. And it's in that context that Hewlett Packard Enterprise is delighted to have a partner like BCD Video, who has the expertise to deploy surveillance systems that, that outperform the standard off the rack IT systems and uh, setting a solid technical foundation so that you can rely on the basic functionality and, and focus more of your time on, on critical issues like privacy and then policy and analytics and things like that. So, you know, on behalf of Intel and HPE, we hope this session has been valuable. Uh, we'd encourage you to download the uh, solution brief to learn more about BCD Video and their solution based on HPE technology, or uh, or contact your local HPE rep or uh, or me or Jeff, and uh, we'd be happy to help too. And so, with that, you know, why I think we can move back to any remaining Q and A. I appreciate that perspective. Um, I, I'd like to ask a couple of uh, general questions, uh, one of them concerning the availability and the pros and cons of using the cloud and the storage, which adds an extra dimension to your networks. Uh, in general, uh, maybe I'll start with you, Lieutenant Minter. What, how, how do you see the pros and cons of incorporating the cloud in being able to um, accommodate um, both the, the storage and, and also the, uh, recognizing the bandwidth requirements? Well, it, it, Today, in police departments, uh, body-worn cameras is a big thing. Uh, we've seen it nationally. Uh, they talked about it. Uh, they want every officer to have body-worn cameras. Many of the, the companies out there that provide those cameras are offering cloud storage. Uh, and cloud storage can be a plus for departments out there that uh, don't have the infrastructure, uh, don't have their own storage capabilities. Uh, and, and it's it's a one package deal. You get your cameras, you get your cloud storage, and uh, you may have to to pay uh, continual fees for that storage. And a lot of it is based on how much you plan to store. Uh, personally, uh, I like having my own storage. If I can afford to have my own storage and manage my own storage, uh, I don't have to worry about uh, uh, somebody uh, you know getting a hold of that storage uh, down the road. I've got it and I can manage it. Uh, I don't have to, to guess how much I'm going to download to that storage and determine exactly how much of a fee I'm going to have to pay uh, for that storage if I have my own. Uh, as far as cameras themselves or, or uh, surveillance cameras, with 1,700 cameras, cloud is not an option. Uh, we have to have our own storage and, and along with that because of the the quality of the, the images that we're storing and the amount of time that we want them stored for, 
uh, cloud is just not an option. I appreciate that. Um, Jeff, I don't know if you have any additional perspective. You having come from um, the IT world to the video world, do you have any additional thoughts on that? Well, I mean, I mean, cloud is just a fancy, you know, cool way to save someone else's server. Um, you know, the only problem that we see with the cloud is uh, is that if the internet's down and you can't get out, who's recording? And where's that in it? And where's that instant footage? You know, um, it, there's just not enough pipe going up to the stratosphere to do some of the larger storage. I mean, for a four to ten, let's say terabyte solution perhaps but you know we see more in our market uh, going to a, what they call a hybrid cloud um, which is like you know for 14 30 60 days on premises and then seeing cloud more like replace tape for long-term storage but it, um, we're, we're seeing with the you know with with what's available right now and what you can get arguably a four terabyte small store server for it's the cloud's not even saving you money so uh, you know um we we, we we do think there's a lot of marketing effort behind cloud that um doesn't really answer all the questions appreciate that and sounds like good advice um one other question um and i'm going to turn this back over to lieutenant minter you, you made an interesting point about calculating the bandwidth um of both you know the use of cameras and uh, sort of frame rate captures and so forth. But you also mentioned that more and more campuses have uh, a lot more users on the network that is, to some degree may not be entirely predictable. So how do, what would your recommendation be about determining the bandwidth environment overall as well as what's required for video? Well, our, our IT department pretty much makes that decision for our school district. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, it was a it was a learning process for us and our IT department, uh, and and we're currently putting fiber in at locations throughout our district that don't have fiber. So I can pull up uh, a location and and see some lag in those cameras, and I know uh, that that location is still running on 10 100 or older uh, technology. And we haven't gotten the fiber to that location yet. But the majority of our district, because of fiber, we, we can handle just about anything now that, that we throw at it. Or, or I haven't found anything that that it can't handle. And that's part of the infrastructure that, that our school district has, has been headed towards over the years. Uh, and it's because of the devices that I talked about earlier that, that we give to all of our students and the programs that we run. The school districts, or the school district, really saw a need to build that infrastructure to be able to handle that, along with our cameras. And you, you have to have, you know, the foresight to be able to, to plan ahead. And that's what we've done and, and been successful at. But if you're, if you don't have that infrastructure, and you try to do something like we did, you're going to fail and you're going to end up spending a lot more money than what you had originally planned to spend. Gotcha. We have time for one more question, and I'm actually going to combine two in this one. Uh, and it's, uh, The question has to do with um, retaining videos for longer lengths of time. And um, uh, what are the advantages of um, uh, carrying that longer video recording uh, inventory uh, onto tape after you're done with the period that you need to hold it, and is there, um, you know, a, a, a kind of pros or cons to using sort of a hybrid hard drive slash storage, uh, um, hard drive slash storage uh, or tape storage uh, solution? Um, well, this is Jeff. I can start it at least. Um, the only, you know, the only thing with tape, the problem with tape is that after time, tape becomes destructible and could could wear out. We're seeing a lot more. Um, hard drive storage, with the price of hard drives being what they are, uh, people basically storing hard drives, you know, for years uh, of that um, over tape. And said, I said, cloud. It, it, there is some usage for cloud for that as well. But um, we're seeing more people using um, not necessarily external plug-in like a USB type 
box to have long-term storage, but, but literally re like replacing hard drives with data and just storing them in fireproof safes. Oh. And, and why Great. this is, Greg, I'll add also that, uh, that you know, there are innovations like software-defined storage that allow you to get to petabyte scale, you know, less IOPS and bandwidth, right, associated with those versus something like a SAN, um, but better economics for, uh, for storage, um, you know, without the hassles about uh, things like tape that Jeff mentioned. Um, so certainly solutions there, you know, with the, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the nascency of software-defined storage. Great. I'm glad you mentioned that. Well, uh, I'm afraid we're going to have to end it there. Um, I want to thank our guests, Lieutenant um, Inter, uh, Jeff Burgess, Elisa Ho, and Greg Herbold. Thank you very much for all your perspectives on today's discussion and some of the lessons that you shared. Uh, I also want to thank our audience, uh, again, for tuning in today, uh, and to um, also uh, thank the folks at Hewlett Packard Enterprise and Intel for underwriting today's program. Uh, just a reminder to our audience, you can download the, all the slides um, uh, using your console, uh, and that our whole program, uh, both slides and audio, will be available on demand for the next 90 days beginning February 18th. So again, if you have colleagues who would benefit from some of the great points we learned today, uh, just send along that email link and they can register to access the program. It's free, so consider sharing what you've learned. Um, with that, um, I just want to add that you can find more of our uh, daily news coverage about surveillance, uh, data analytics, the cloud, privacy, and more at statescoop.com, uh, edscoop.com, and our flagship, fedscoop.com. Uh, but for now, we want to just thank you all for joining us. Uh, on behalf of everyone here on the show and at FedScoop, uh, Edscoop, and Statescoop, uh, thanks for being with us. We'll see you soon.